Hello and welcome to The Art Of. Today's conversation's title is The Art Of, The Sound Physiker. The title is, of course, referring to our main topic of this evening, the inventor, engineer, and pioneer of electronic music, Harald Bode. For the reason of our guests are Pierre Bode, Rebecca Palov, and Tom Ray. We are so happy that you all accepted our invitation. Thank you. Before I will introduce all of you briefly, we're going to see a video about the life of Harald Bode and its most important waypoints. The engineer and inventor Harald Bode in his studio in 1972. In a span of about a century, Harald Bode invented more than 15 instruments and sound devices. Without him, electronic music and sound modulation, the modern synthesizer as we know it, would not exist. Born in Hamburg in 1909, Harald Bode studied mathematics, physics and philosophy at Hamburg University. In 1935, he began to work on electronic instruments. His first instrument, the Warbo Formant organ, was joint work with Christian Warnke in 1937. Bode then moved to Berlin and completed postgraduate studies at Heinrich Hatz Institute. During this time, Bode, along with collaborators Oskar Fierling and Feko von Omteda, developed his own instrument, the Melodium, a monophonic melody instrument with touch-sensitive keyboard and multi-timbral capability. With the emerging war, Bode worked on submarine sound and wireless communication projects to avoid the military service and moved to the countryside to a small Bavarian village, Neuboyern. There, in the so-called Zauberhaus, he builds his first version of his famous Melochord in 1947, the first European post-war electronic instrument. It was used, among others, in the legendary Studio für Elektronische Musik in Cologne. In the years that followed, Bode developed a series of electronic keyboard instruments. Their design fluctuated between imitating known instruments and enabling completely new sound possibilities. For example, the polychord, the Bode organ, the tutti vox and the clavioline. In 1954, Bode moved to the USA with his family, his wife Irmgard and his sons Ralph and Peer. He settled in Brattleboro, Vermont. He had been hired by the Etsy Organ Corporation as Director of Research and Development and later was co-president to develop cost-effective mass-produced electronic organs for the American market. In October 1961, Bode presented the modular synthesizer and sound processor at the Audio Engineering Society convention. A new tool for the exploration of unknown electronic music instrument performances. This instrument later became known as the Audio System Synthesizer. The system included a conventional tape deck, tape loop reverberation and plug-in modules. Bode had built the first patchable modular system with control voltage capability. The young Bob Moog adopted Bode's concept and designed his famous Moog synthesizer. Moog and Bode built a strong partnership over the next couple of years and more inventions were about to come. The audio system synthesizer was followed by the invention of the Klangumwandler frequency shifter and the ring modulator both in 1961. The Bode vocoder, invented in 1977, was a particular success and noted for its unique sound. 
He can be found on hit records of the era, but also in the work of video artists Gary Hill and the Vasulkas. This is the voice of the border recorder. This is the voice of the border recorder. In 1972, the Bode Sound Company was founded. In the same year, Bode lost his wife Irmgard. Two years later, he retired from Bell Aerospace, where he had spent the last 10 years developing microcircuits. This allowed Bode to concentrate more on his inventions. In 1981, he introduced his last instrument, the Barber Pole Phaser which he presented at the Audio Engineering Society convention. He died on January 15, 1987, in New York City. Happy, how do you relate to all this stuff? How do you relate to all this equipment? Yes, uh, well, I, I uh, must say I relate uh, very much to the equipment. I uh, relate very much to the music or the sounds that it makes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, a constant uh, evolutionary thing uh, to, uh, not for the sake of filling this room or for, for making, oh, making it right. look more sophisticated, but for the sake of uh, having new and more means of uh, limitless expressions. Per Bode is an artist and an educator. He is professor for video arts for 33 years and chair of the Division of Expanded Media and co-directs, where he is also the co-founder of the Institute of Electronic Arts for 24 years at Alfred University of it. In 1976, he became ETC Experimental Television Center Birmingham Program Director. He is a member of the Carrier Band with Pauline Oliveros, Andrew Deutsch, Stefan Vitiello and Rebecca Palov. Together with Rebecca, he built the Harold Bode archives with his generosity gifted to ZGAM 2019. Rebecca Palov built the Harold Bode archive together with Pierre until it was gifted to ZGAM. She did enormous work in research and visibility of the archive in general. She's an audio and video artist who lives and works in Hornell, New York. She's a research administrative specialist and runs the experimental project residency and the time-based studio program at the Institute of Electronic Arts. School of Art and Design at Alfred University. And Tom Ray is an associate professor at the Music Synthesis Department at Berklee College of Music, Boston, Massachusetts. He is a historian for electronic music devices and instruments. As a MOOC synthesizer clinician and a functional design consultant, a documentation writer and a marketing ex executive, he did his PhD on the evolution of electronic instruments in the United States. At the moment, Tom, you're working on the new book, which is called Electronical Perspectives, Vintage Electronic Music Instruments. So I'm very curious to read this. Um, and first I want to talk about what is in my opinion, the heart of the Harald Bode estate, the notebooks or diaries of Harald Bode. As you probably already heard from my struggles to address them, clearly those books are kind of some double character, right? They are in, in diary entries, thoughts, and philosophical ideas, and precise sketches, drawings, diagrams, and calculations on inventions, on instruments. If you go through the whole collection, and I mean Harald Bode's whole life with them, because it started writing those in 1933, and continue basically until his death in, in January 1987. If you go through the whole collection, and you can see them a shift from the diary character, more to a notebook character of the books without losing it completely, like the, the character, like there are different shades of character always together. Bob, how do you, uh, Bob, sorry, um, Pierre, how did you experience your father writing those notebooks? Was it something he did once a day, something you, um, he did in, in, his, in his office? How, how was the, the writing process over the... Uh, yeah, that's a nice question. I, I, I saw him uh, write in his notebooks infrequently. Uh, and it, this is really uh, being a kid, Saturday morning, I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons and um, puppy is in the living room. 
and he's wearing a suit and tie, and he's sitting writing in his notebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an image I saw a number of times, but I have to say, not very often. Um, uh, but it was such that I knew that he, he wrote in notebooks. Uh, it turns out, actually, the day after he passed away, I, re I thought, gee, I wonder where those notebooks are. Or, and I imagined maybe it was two or three notebooks. Uh, and I went into uh, a closet with a, a file cabinet, and in the bottom drawer of the file cabinet uh, were, to my surprise, 50 years of notebooks. And that's the first time I was ever really aware of the extent of them. Okay. Because like the, I have one, one of the interesting part in the notebooks I found, and I was like, thinking about this process was in this, I'm going to show it on my screen. Um, in 1939, he wrote that he needs some time of loneliness to work. Like he, he's writing in German, and um, I couldn't translate it, of course. Um, I, um, I need those hours of being alone with myself, this loneliness. And he was wondering, how should this work now that I'm married? Of course, like he married Im Irmgard um, a couple of um, um, weeks be before that. So um, that ref is it. Should we imagine Harald Bode as a solitary person somehow when he was working? Like, what was, what was your impression of him um, and his relation to his his wife? Because he in that it seems a little contradictory that he was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a family father now, I'm a I'm a married man, but I have to be alone to work. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I you know I think in 1939 that's a point that's early in his career and and his new wife. Uh, it, that's a situation that was very unique to that moment. Uh, I think uh, what I experienced, which was many years later, I was born in 52. Yeah. Uh, you know, by that point, um, uh, my brother, who was born in 41, I believe, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the family life was in play. And what I saw was someone who um, juggled a lot of time frames. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, my father worked at a number of companies and uh, he, uh, or, you know, he would work, be working at Wurlitzer or uh, SD Organ or Wurlitzer or Bell yeah. Aerospace as an engineer. Uh, he would come home, uh, have uh, a light dinner with the family, and then he would go down to his studio and work mm -hmm. for two or three hours. And this was a regular kind of um, schedule because he really had more than one project in play. That was what he was doing uh, at his day job, so to speak, which was uh, no doubt teaching him a lot of things as well. Uh, and then the evening was the time that he was down in his lab and he was in his workshop uh, and he was uh, building devices and he was making sound recordings. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, we had a family life and, and uh, uh, my mother, who was a uh, remarkable uh, personality, dynamic personality, um, uh, and a great cook and gardener, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, the, the, those lines are, I think, an indication of kind of the sensitivity of, of the person, Harold, and his concerns. And by the time I was around uh, and experienced that that had been worked into um, a, a kind of fa a family style or you know, I, I was thinking of um, Peter Sloterdijk's notion of uh, these sort of bubbles and foam and uh, <laughs> this this thing of um, uh, different kind of insulation systems. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and, you know, this family structure was it was a really uh, significant one. And and uh, uh, but I think he, to come back to your question, he he managed his time, I think, very well. And he had his time to himself in his studio. He also did half hour walks every evening, uh, usually by himself. Uh, uh, so he would have a chance to think. And I, coming back to your question about the notebooks, I think the notebooks, I agree, are extremely significant. And they, they are this place where a kind of meditation was happening, where he could really uh, think about uh, and imagine and uh, uh, deal with the creative process. Um, uh, and that was another place where he could then, in a sense, be be with himself to really have uh, uh, kind of uh, intensive uh, thoughts and research that he was needing to do.
Yeah, I mean, um, one of the significant part of those notebooks are, um, I show it on my screen, the, in every notebook and from the beginning till the end, he's using this, this um, parts in the notebooks, which he calls zum Programm, which is German for like to or about the program. And it's lists where he was noting, okay, what I have to do, what I have to think about it. But it's a variety of like topics of sorts, work-related, family-related. It's everything, like everything which is his life. And and if I'm correct, um, he he made this um, very this, this black columns, and he's really, he um, like filling those columns if the work if the if, if it like a check mark, so it's done right. when it's filled, right? right? And it's right. It was fascinating to see what he was um, thinking and, 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 and noting about and, not, and noticing. Well, he was on a trajectory, right? He was he was um, he was inventing yeah. his world. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot to keep track of, and uh, that's one. I think of the notebooks as a machine that helped make the life and make other machines. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe it happened throughout the notebooks. Uh, they actually were uh, written in two different directions: the front. Uh, it would go from the front to wherever, and then he would flip it over and have uh, the other side, one side be more technical oriented mm -hmm. and the other side be more personal reflections. Yes. Uh, and wherever they met is where that notebook would end and a new notebook would begin. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's 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 my impression too. Like, And I found um, this passage in the notebook where he's describing himself it was it's very early it's like also in the in, in the in the 30s when he when he wrote that but um i think he kept this idea of himself like when he's wrote writing um i translated um, in english um i'm a painter i'm a composer i'm a poet i'm a writer i'm an inventor i'm a grotesque comedian i'm a philosopher and all this sounds quite pretentious she says but um all of this must now be reconcealed recon and that's a question for you tom like when you work with him, is it was all those facets visible for you? Did do you rem remember Harold as a variety of all those um, different characters, or um, how did how how do you live with him? Well, I knew Harold primarily uh, as some of those, uh, certainly as the inventor. Uh, I don't know what grotesque comedian means, <laughs> German, but. He had a terrific sense of humor, and it was very sly. You, you could be uh, talking to him and realize, oh, <laughs> he's made a joke, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, yes, I think he was all of those things. He was uh, uh, certainly a composer, and people know little about his composition. He was a performer as well. I'm not sure that was there. Uh, he played on the radio in Germany. And one of the interesting things about Harold that's not true of all the historical figures that I've uh, known about, which is a number of them, is uh, he went on both sides of the tracks. He, he would do the popular, but he would also uh, be with the avant-garde. You know, uh, when uh, his instrument was at the, 50, the, the early 50s Cologne studio in Germany, uh, that was certainly avant-garde. There was nothing popular about that. But on the other hand, his earlier uh, exploits with the mellow chord, which was in that studio, were popular. They were radio. They were so-called light music. So he was definitely a, a person of many dimensions, as this passage is illustrating. Yeah. And, and, and his wife lived with him through those different facets, right? Because like when you mentioned the mellow chord, Imgard also um, did like um, was part of the demonstrations, and we have, have recordings of her um, demonstrating the mellow chord and, and telling what is it about like this invention and so on. Mm -hmm. Like it's becoming to that point later, but Bode business is a family business somehow. Do you agree, Pierre? Um, I, you know, I never used that kind of vocabulary, but I, I it's sort of very business vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it, it um, uh, you know, I think that there was a, uh, I don't know, team effort or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was clearly my mother was uh, engaged uh, in various ways. I wish I knew more about that, uh, actually. Um, uh, but uh, 
uh, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that one in in a way that's really meaningful, except that there, there it was clear that um, uh, Puppy was inventing tools and building tools, and uh, that, and I think that I mean I remember as a little kid I didn't understand much about it, but I knew something really exciting, significant was happening, and even as a little kid I had a lot of respect for. The fact that there was this workshop downstairs and things were being built and I was hearing things through the floorboards my whole life that were amazing sounds uh, that he was making. So it, it what he was doing was not hidden to us. It wasn't that he was going somewhere else and we had no idea what he was doing. It really was part of, part of how we were living. Uh, and Puppy used to like turning up the music loud. He, he did that when he did his, and he loved to play his instruments for people. And so we heard, we heard things all the time and they were rich, big sounds. He had big speakers. He was really into the whole sonic experience. Um, yeah. So in, in this, that's, that's the family business. Uh, uh, um, c clearly he had a business and Tom can certainly talk about that as well because he, he built instruments for many, many different people uh, and yes. he built them downstairs. Yeah. Um, yeah, just one one thing I found in the archive as well is was that um, I told you about these letters to an imaginary friend, which he wrote in 1935, which is basically a part, try to make an a, like a literature part of him of him. Oh. Like he, he tried to. There's a um, the whole book is about letters to someone who, where he is telling about his own experience in life at that moment in time. It's like very beautiful written. And you also like when he writing when he's writing he's I'm a poet I'm a writer, he's referring I think to that as well. So that's that's a that's a comp component, um, which is um, also quite interesting for me as well. Yeah, I, I I'm not familiar with it. I ha I hadn't seen that, uh, and read that, um, but it does not surprise me. And I think that list that you showed earlier, of uh, being a painter and a and uh, a writer and uh, etc. That that. I think that that really did live in Puppy. That was in terms of his identity. It really was about spanning across all of those. So, you know, that's where the notebooks are not just the notebooks. And in, in a way, the, the the many other pages there there are, as you know, boxes and boxes of other drawings that where he was drawing these circuits over and over again. And they are they are like electronic landscapes. I mean, obviously they're their technical drawings, but they're way beyond what's needed. Uh, uh, there's a great pleasure in the drawing of those. They're drawings of uh, the mellichord and the in the melodium uh, and the polychord that are beautiful pencil drawings. They're uh, um, and I in the in the uh, seventy two uh, documentary uh, he makes mention of, of the fact that uh, early on. Uh, when he was starting out, he actually made money as an artist on the street. He would draw, he would um, uh, do portraits of people. Um, so I, you know, th th and it's in that documentary as well where he makes this point about uh, developing one's skill or one's talents, and that uh, one has many different talents. And in a sense, sort of a goal of life is to develop those talents and understand who one is as a person. So it's a, it, it begins to really come together as a kind of philosophical human project of what, what is the human being capable of. Um, uh, and that, that piece of, you know, he studied with uh, 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 Cassier in, uh, at Hamburg University, significant uh, 20th century philosopher who really bridges um, science and uh, symbolic forms and, and uh, I, I, this is a bit of my imagination, but I think that that you that that input and that experience, I think, really did guide him also to a, a kind of a larger picture of where technology fits into a human um, a human dynamic, a human um, uh, uh, evolving uh, uh, process. That where he's extreme technologist. At the other hand, he's he's this amazing humanist. Um, yeah, like the first, the first starting point, so to say, it's of course the Warburg Warburg organ, 
which invented in 1937. So somehow its first major instrument, like um, he did to, to, together, that's the reason why it's called Warbo, together with Christian Warnke, like a, a German violinist. And um, perhaps Tom, you can, you, there's the, on the screen, there's the article you wrote in, um, could you tell us about, like the organ is it's destroyed, right? It, it was, it, it burned down in fire, but um, so we, we can't have a, like a, like a sound example of it, but perhaps you can tell us something about the organ. Yes, uh, this is a most important uh, instrument. I guess it was almost a one of, as you're implying. Uh, and I'm sure at that point, 1937, it was extremely difficult for Harold to get parts. So I'm sure he cannibalized one thing to build another thing, uh, something that many of the early pioneers had to do. The reason the Varbo uh, format organ is important historically, in the middle of that article that you see on that right hand page, uh, which I'll give you a better uh, copy of that, uh, there is a diagram which explains what we call an assignment keyboard. Now, in uh, early electronic musical instruments, most of them were monophonic. That's not bad. Most musical instruments are. Uh, and then when polyphony came in, it was what we called in the synthesizer world limited polyphony. Uh, four voices, five voices, uh, and then eight voices. In other words, all the keys did not play. Uh, but so what do you do if you have four voices and you have 56 keys or something like that? You have to have a way of sensing where those keys will be. Now, the modern way of doing it is a so-called scanning keyboard, which uses digital technology to look at the keys one after another very rapidly and then sense when one is being pressed down and so forth. Uh, that is not what this is with the uh, Varbo. Uh, it's actually an analog way of doing this. Brilliant. Uh, and I don't know whether this earned a patent for Harold, but it should have. Uh, this is a predecessor of the scanning keyboard. Uh, and that, uh, ex that little diagram right in the center uh, expresses that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harold explained it to me, and I understood at the time, but he was a pretty good teacher. So... <laughs> Uh, as I've told some of my students, uh, it's one thing to understand something as somebody explains it to you. It's another thing to retain that and to understand it later. But Harold was such a good teacher that he could make you understand it, you know, and uh, then later you'd be like, oh, uh, gosh, how did that work? But it was brilliant, uh, and it used analog circuitry indeed. So you had four voices, but you had many keys. And of course, there has to be a way to share those keys. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have what's known as a keyboard priority. Well, does it play the highest note, the lowest note? Uh, what happens if you play five notes? Does it, where does it rob? And so forth. That whole uh, paradigm came in later. But Harold had solved this problem in 1937, basically, with the Varbo which was known as an organ, but yeah. uh, that has an element of synthesis, which is the first one that, uh, and the reason I made that the first column that I did about Harold in, uh, when I did these in Keyboard Magazine, yes. uh, 77 through 81, quite long ago. <laughs> Well, the important thing uh, that happened between the Varbo and the mellow chord is uh, modularity uh, and other considerations that are difficult to articulate. Uh, the, the very fact that the mellow chord was in the Cologne studio and was used by Meyer Epler and Eimert and uh, some other uh, uh, composers and, and technologists uh, indicates that they recognized the importance of it. Uh, they also had Troutwine's uh, mono chord, but 
basically that was a, a tip of the hat to the past. Uh, when Boda's Melacord appeared in the Cologne studio early 50s, uh, that was a realization on the progenitors of that studio that he belonged there. Now, it's very interesting, as a matter of fact, that although, uh, yes, here we go, although the Melacord was used by a number of the very earliest uh, participants in the studio, when Stockhausen came in, he decided, uh, well, he has he had to, I guess, that uh, no, we're not going to use that instrument, you know, we're going to have uh, sine wave generators and, and so forth and so on. A lot of people don't realize, too, about the, the uh, Cologne studio, their house organ, and I don't mean an instrument, I mean a publication in this case, their house organ was called De Raya, uh, which uh, in my limited German, I'm pretty sure that means the row and uh, or something that would uh, translate approximately to that. Now, what they were really interested in from Stockhausen on was dodecaphonic music, 12-tone music. Yes. And uh, they didn't care you know, what the timbre was. So what the Melacord offered to Stockhausen was not a mu of much interest. And, and it's too bad in a way because uh, I think he sort of truncated uh, the possibility of the Melacord's use in a more uh, general sense by uh, any number of composers that may have come to the studio. Yeah. But, uh, after uh, a bit, they were more interested in dodecaphonic music and uh, all the machinations of that, which, by the way, is one of the short, shortest-lived uh, epochs in music history, uh, I might say, just my personal aside. But uh, yes, the Melacord was central. That was like the second uh, epoch in Harold's career, the early uh, in the 30s, then 50s, and then later with Moog and the vocoder and so forth, as we will see. The next step, so to say, is then the um, the, the modular processor, right? The the the, the sound the sound the, synthesizer. The sound synthesizer. 1960. Uh, well, it published in uh, in an article in 1961. A yeah. very interesting instrument. Uh, yeah. The only thing it lacked from being what we would call a modern analog synthesizer was voltage control. Uh, now that's considerable. Voltage control is extremely important. You use voltages to uh, change operating points such as frequency, timbre, loudness, and so forth, instead of turning knobs and moving levers and so forth. That's but, something. That's something. Um, MOOC later on did right. That's uh, that's the yes. new the next step. MOOC. Yeah. Both. yeah. Both Moog and Donald F. Buchla, Robert A. Moog and Donald F. Buchla uh, had voltage control, yeah. which was extremely important. But uh, when I talked to Bob, and I, I worked with Bob for many years, uh, when I talked to him, he very candidly said, well, of course, when he saw Harold's uh, article from 1961, it became obvious to him, oh, yes, of course, modularity, that's the way things should be. So once again, here, the first in the 30s with the assignment keyboard. Now, you know, in the, uh, the, the 50s with modularity and leading up to the, the early 60s with the sound synthesizer, as Harold called it, mm -hmm. uh, we have once again, Harold leading the way. He wrote technical papers for the audio engineering system quite a bit. And then he also wrote a history of electronic sound modification, which is really interesting because, again, with the notebooks that he's um, placing himself, again, trying to resolve himself and his activities and also his um, contributions. And so he places himself within that. His, his sort of notion of his um, legacy within a legacy is very clear within the notebooks and within that one particular project. Um, and again, the technical writing came later. Yeah. I would say that, too, about his sort of interest in writing. Paris brought this up, that he, he enjoyed writing. He always yeah. did enjoy writing. It went more technical later on. They yeah. has, he's noted for the correspondence. In particular, wow, we found this huge stack between he and Vladimir Usachevsky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Extensive correspondence with development and with uh, Christian Varnka, too, that he was, it's written, or Harold said, he really worked with um, the musician 
how does the performativity work with this new technology of the instrument as well? So he was from the start quite keen on this, um, yeah. who and how it would be used. Wasatchewski is a very important person. We're going to come to that for the next instrument. Um, I want to just um, give us an, a short um, um, example of the synthesizer. The synthesizer. The sound of bongo drums through variable filters and a ring modulator with variable carrier frequency. This is Harald, right? Yes. And then how, is, how goes the story with the frequency shifter? He built this frequency shifter, but he also made different, also different variations of it. Like on this image, we see um, the one for an ornithologist, right? Like the some like a bird spotter. Um, but that's, yeah, but that's that, a... that was a project that was, um, that's that's later. I actually want to say that's in the 70s. Yeah, 1977. Uh, yeah, 77, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah and, and that's a case where actually, um, uh, this ornithologist is that it? Uh, he um, <laughs> uh, he had hearing. He had lost part of his hearing, so he still wanted to be able to do his bird research and contacted puppy. And the frequency shifter was to actually shift the sound frequencies of the birds down so that he could hear them. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's a photograph of. Uh, uh, that frequency shifter in a case that uh, Jean Boda, who is uh, my father's second wife, after my mother passed away, he remarried. Um, and they both worked side by side, literally. Uh, uh, she was, uh, did all, she did many things, but she, she sewed that bag. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, but it was a project that he was, he was excited that it was a, a different use for the instrument because it, this, this, it's in the notebooks also this thing of looking for every possibility in ex this thing of uh, ausprobieren, experiment, uh, not being able to sort of predetermine and preset what something was. And as you say, there were many models of the frequency shifter uh, that happened. Um, and uh, you could probably look at a lot of the um, devices and say that they're all very related. And they, pro they probably to varying degrees really are related but then he found significant, he, he discovered significant differences that could really uh, uh, then be evidenced or be, could be manifest as an instrument versus another, this model versus that model versus another model. Um, uh, we, and the, the yeah. Usachevsky piece, I don't, I, I agree with Rebecca, I don't think we, we know exactly sort of how, what's, what's, how that exactly began, but it is a relationship uh, in a collaboration where back and forth they were working towards improving and maximizing signal to noise ratios and various things to make those uh, frequency shifters um, uh, uh, more more effective and more successful. Usachevsky had a studio, the, the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Studio, one of the first in the country or first that was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and became a model for electronic music studios all across uh, the United States. Um, and in the early days of that studio, there were many international uh, composers who came through and quite a few of them used the frequency shifter. So my point around that is that what they were developing and with their collaboration was in a sense being tested in the studio, like what maybe yeah. wasn't able to happen uh, to that extent at the Cologne studio, uh, there was a case with Usachevsky and Pearl Smiley and uh, Daria uh, Simonsons that they really used those devices. And as Rebecca said, some of them are being used to this very day uh, at uh, SUNY Purchase. And it wasn't only it was not only the classical avant-garde, right? It was also like um, groups like Kraftwerk, for example, who use it use the frequency shifter for numbers, for example, for one of. That's the, what we yeah. have found out that uh, yeah. computer world. The sound of computer world is frequency shifters, uh, uh, or a frequency shifter, 
which does fit into a kind of tradition of uh, uh, the the um, the transition to digital culture. Uh, a lot of it was actually the actual sounds and images for that were actually created with analog devices. Maybe not a surprise, but uh, you know that's another case of it. Yes. Well, was Kraftwerk? I mean, I'm particularly interested in Kraftwerk because, like, you know, the, when Zetgam was founded, Kraftwerk was the group who, who who played the opening. So we have a little oh. connection to that as well. Oh, um, I didn't know that. It, is it some? Is it music? What Harold also enjoyed as uh, personally? Oh, or totally. Is, yeah. We we would every every holiday, every Christmas, we would buy Puppy Kraftwerk records. <laughs> and he had all the albums, and he en he enjoy he absolutely enjoyed the sounds. And the curious thing, I I got to meet and and have now become friends with Emil Schult, who was part of the original group and forming of that group. Uh, he and he did the record covers for. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, computer world and uh, radioactivity, etc. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, uh, c one of the curious things about listening to the Kraftwerk records was that those were exactly the sounds. Many of those were exactly the sounds that Puppy had that I grew up with from Puppy playing them downstairs. Talking about the relationship between Usachevsky and Harold, uh, I think it's an interesting note. There, I think it may have been a triangle. I think it may have been Usachevsky, Harold Boda, and Robert Moog, okay. because a lot of people don't know that Usachevsky uh, literally specified the ADSR envelope generator to Bob Moog. And of course, Harold was working with Bob uh, at that time. And uh, I, I was surprised, as a matter of fact, I, I looked at an old thing from the Moog company the other night and was surprised at how many Boda modules there were for sale from the Moog company. So uh, I think there was a cross-fertilization uh, between Harold uh, and primarily Harold through Usachevsky, but I think Usachevsky got some ideas from Harold possibly. And uh, possibly, and this is a bit tenuous, pass them on to Bob Moog. Uh, on the other hand, Bob and Harold were working with each other directly, and they eventually came out with a frequency shifter of a different sort than had been done before, uh, which I think was patented. Uh, here, we, here we see the vocoder. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very important, too, in craft work and a number of other artists. So that, 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 that's like the, the, the next step on the instrument um, Harald invented. It's 1977, right? The vocoder. Yes. Um, um, also, for, like, if you're talking about pop music, like Funky Town from Lip Syncs is, um, is made with the vocoder and also some of the thriller, thriller Michael Jackson's thriller um, pieces, as I read. And that's very important, like for important for that game as well. Like Vas the Vasulkas and Gary Hill also worked with the vocoder. As, like, so there's the step into the, the art world, like the, like the media art world, so to say, um, where the connection is also via you pair, right? You, you, you studied at Buffalo as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we uh, listen to the, to one of the tracks. It's like one of my favorite um, records. This is the voice of the Buddha Vakoda. This is the voice of the Buddha Vakoda. A vocoder is a so-called complementary filter. It has two sets of filters. Uh, one on the an analysis side and the other on the synthesis side. Uh, if you think about your voice as uh, frequencies that are dynamic, if you use what's known as fric fricatives and sibilants, there's uh, pretty much above 5,000. Uh, and then you think about your voice, even for women, it's actually the voiced part is much lower. Uh, and, and, if you can separate those things 
you can make uh, speech that's intelligible. And the way it works is you input, let's say, your voice into the so-called program input. It divides your voice up into these bands, and then it goes through something called an envelope follower. And what that does is uh, changes the rapid moving uh, changes to what the envelope, uh, the the slow amplitude changes are. Well, the bottom line is that becomes a control voltage. Uh, and then on the uh, synthesis side, those control what's known as voltage controlled amps. So if you place a organ or a, a electronic musical instrument of any sort into the other side of the vocoder, you can make when you change over here with your voice, that channel changes the same channel over here, and therefore you can make vacuum cleaners talk and uh, synthesizers talk and organs talk and anything uh, talk, basically. Now, what was interesting about Harold's vocoder was uh, he ported some of the sibilant sounds, these high-pitched sounds, directly to audio, and therefore his instrument became more intelligible. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the emotional content of singing or talking is carried by the low part, the voice. The intelligibility aspect of when we speak is caused by consonants. And you know this if you've ever heard people arguing through a wall in an apartment. It's you get the emotional part, but you don't know what they're saying because you can't really hear the highs. Uh, and of course, also with Harold's vocoder, you had inputs and outputs for these two sides and you could scramble them. And as a matter of fact, this played. Uh, uh, Harold didn't invent the vocoder, Homer Dudley did basically at Bell Labs, but he improved it and he made uh, something that he thought was appropriate for uh, music uh, m more than some of the other ways it had been uh, used. Bell Labs actually developed this the vocoder so you could run many telephone conversations on one wire, it's called multiplexing, but pulse code modulation came along very soon after that. There was no need to do it the old fashioned way, which was vocoding. So, yeah, it, it, it it's a, an interesting device that uh, has a lot of directions, uh, including the code, coding voices for World War II and uh, craft work, <laughs> everything from in between. And the last instrument Bode invented was the barber bowl phaser, right? Like the in 18, 1981. He invented that, this. Um, he, in an interview, he said, this is probably his most important invention and it's going to start a new area of modulating sounds. It's like, Rebecca, how can we, is it correct? <laughs> like, um, was it a new area? Is it a new era after that? I actually, I think in a, the interview with Jim Finch, he says that sort of, um, he, he laments the end of that era when the um, the digital synthesizers came in and the analog processing. So yeah. it is like a premier um, example of analog processing before he, and yeah. it's in the flange phase um, family too, which also stylistically was um, very excited at that moment. Yes. Like, uh, personally, but, it's a, it's, but it's a beautiful, remarkable like, shepherd's tone, gorgeous instrument. Yeah. Um, and very few were made. I think there were like three or four. It was very limited in its production. We're going to listen to a small example and then we're going to talk more about that. Yeah, it's based on the the... Uh, the idea that uh, ascending and descending, you can actually make these phase changes. And as you go up or down, if you get, you can't get to the bottom because when you start getting to the bottom, you slyly and slowly bring in the top again. And this is why it's known as circular uh, or barber pole. A barber pole, of course, you, you see something that appears to go up 
uh, continuously, but it, it's doing nothing of the kind. It's standing still. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, it was a bit expensive to implement, I think, uh, in an analog fashion. And it, it just never totally hit uh, the mainstream. I don't can't say why. You know, it's uh, it's rather elusive. Uh, Jean-Claude Rousset did uh, an actual piece based on the barber pole concept, but uh, it, it, it just was out of its time somehow. I think, you know, I, it's interesting to see the, um, some of the correspondence around that time, and this is the last instrument, so this is really t uh, the, towards the end of uh, my father's career, and, uh, uh, but there's exchanges with Wendy Carlos, uh, who was at that time uh, uh, working on the soundtrack for the film Tron. Uh, and she was very excited about the possibilities of uh, what you could do with that. And Susan Ciani uh, uh, was another person who was very excited about uh, 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 and saw the, the implications in, uh, for, from a technical point of view, but also from a sonic uh, point of view. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that could have played itself out differently. I mean, this, this thing of how things are received and when the timing, as you say, Tom, is sort of elusive, <laughs> what happened or didn't happen, uh, with that device. Although now that's digitally, uh, something that shows up in, uh, many, uh, forms, uh, as are a number of, uh, my father's instruments and ideas now. Uh, as Tom, you've pointed out in your writings, they they now live in the digital realm. They they're they're apps. They're there are uh, uh, they now are part of the basic vo sound vocabulary of the 21st century, um, uh, and they in most cases don't have the Boda name associated to them, although a few of them do. Um, yeah. So, I think that, you know, the, I want to say two things. One, the correspondences in terms of the archive, that's a very interesting one to really dig into. And there, uh, uh, th that's a very rich, and that is partly this, uh, as, as Rebecca said, this uh, pleasure that uh, Harold had in writing. Uh, also, the sound samples, that's actually quite interesting. Like Tom mentioned that Harold was a good teacher. Um, uh, and he... Uh, uh, part of his uh, sound samples were, uh, oh, we have some nice sound events going on here. Um, some of his, uh, those sample tapes, he made sample tapes and the sample tapes were a way that he was also teaching people how to use the instruments. Uh, and that goes even to uh, exchanges with Meyer Epler where he said, you know, did you receive the tape yet? Yes, I did receive the tape. Very, very impressive. This is now we understand what it is that uh, it is capable of. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Michel Jarre, the uh, French electronic uh, uh, music uh, uh, composer, uh, I saw in a correspondence a similar thing of Harold sending this tape with uh, uh, 20 different samples and really showing what the device did. Because one of the things he told me relative to the vocoder uh, uh, is um, uh, that p uh, musicians, there was a whole long experience history that he had of musicians not knowing how to use his instruments. Mm. And it was really just because the field hadn't trained people. It was, it was a vocabulary that came out of physics. He was exactly uh, Cassier talking about the scientific culture and uh, the, the uh, symbolic culture. Um, the, it hadn't, he was doing things that really were new, new sounds, new possibilities. And you, it was a vocabulary you had to learn to uh, uh, speak. Um, and so the, the sample tapes are a way that we get to hear the sound of the instruments, but it's important to realize pedagogically, they were actually partially to teach people what, and, and for them to also just hear it. They still had to then learn how to do it. Uh, but, you know, he provided all that information, what the settings were, that what the, there's num numerous patch diagrams. And if you look at the patch diagrams and you think of these modular systems 
as analog computers, which in a sense they are, then basically patching is programming. So this, this thing of uh, 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 what the sound sounds like that's in the sample, the diagram that's the patch, that actually is how the device is programmed, that again is this uh, new, new kind of pedagogy, and it is this, uh, it, it, you know, plus the fact that it's new music studios. It's a, it's a totally uh, uh, new kind of way of making music, which we now live in the, in the world where it's now no longer new. But uh, I, I just saw, and I love this, this line, I just saw uh, a, uh, an article that Casper uh, Abacob, who did really important research on Harold's work and two two hour long radio features on German radio uh, it was a 19. He gave me he sent me in 1937. This this is around the era of the Varbo format organ uh, article uh, that was in a, a Hamburg, uh, uh, Germany, uh, newspaper. And one of the lines is, uh, and it's it's the reporter going to the workshop of the young inventor, and uh, the young inventor Harold says. Now I'm going to solder a new town, a, a tone sound, uh, uh, sound tone, tone sound, tone color. Now I'm going to solder a new tone color. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, um, but this thing of learning the new language, I mean, Tom mm -hmm. certainly, and Rebecca does too, uh, knows all about, uh, you know, electronic tools are, uh, a new kind of tool in the history of music, and one needs, it takes time to, to learn to actually um, be articulate with them. Uh, I've spent a better part of my life teaching people about electronic musical instruments. And Harold, he did wonderful work. His demos were part and part of that. It, people had, the, not only did they not know, quote, how to work the, the device, they really just didn't have any ideation about what would you do with this? Uh, what are the possibilities? And Harold, when he put out these cassettes in particular uh, of the, all these things that he brought forth, he was trying to show people, look, it's more than you think. In other words, the, the average person thought of a vocoder is uh, like I alluded to previously, making vacuum cleaners talk. And that, that was about their limit of imagination for it. They never thought to put a drum machine in there and put an organ through and have a pad that's very interesting and all kinds of things you using the other things that Harold had developed the frequency shifter in conjunction with the vocoder and uh, Harold did a wonderful job, not only of doing those tapes, but he was all over the media, whether in Germany or in other places teaching his colleagues how these things worked. In other words, he was great at Ballyhoo. He was great at getting the word out. Uh, so the business side that he manifested there, he was talking about being a philosopher, being a painter, being a composer, being an artist, and so forth. He was all of those things. He was also a pretty darn good businessman, which some people that he dealt with were not. Yeah, you had to, right? Like, it was... I mean, he worked for for Bell Laboratories, um, like a um, couple oh, of aerospace. years. Aerospace. Aerospace. I'm sorry. Yeah, aerospace. And but um, the inventions and the and the selling of the patents was always a very important part of the income of the family somehow, right? It's. Uh, I don't know that the patents were an income source. Uh, I think okay. they were, though. Uh, Tom, you may have a better sense of that than I do. I. But I, th I think there was, it, there's something about the field in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, for, the way, I, I'm fishing for some words, but it was important to him to do the patents. And he, he also paid attention to the whole field and the history of the field and the patents that were out there. So that was certainly a, an area that he, uh, took great interest and pride in, and uh, as you say, he he had many patents. Many things were patented, and some, as you've mentioned, Tom, you know, were not, uh, and maybe should have been. I I think most people don't under understand really what a patent is. It has twofold. A lot of people think, well, it's to protect what I've done. Well, yes, it is that, but it's very limited protection. It's seventeen years, 
And that's not a long time. Buckminster Fuller never, never made a dime off the geodesic idea. It was too far ahead. I don't think Harold made much money because he patented things. I think he was a good German scientist and realized, you know, it's my obligation to publish, mm -hmm. publish my work to make it available to the public to advance knowledge. I think it was a kind of a generosity on his part as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, yes, I don't, I don't think it was a very big income stream, and Harold certainly was ahead of his time. <clears throat> I'm certain by the time some of the things he had patented came to popular fruition, uh, he couldn't have benefited from it, everybody. I mean, I see now all the time people even using his model numbers, which I think is a bit of a shame. I see 1630 Boda frequency shifters. Well, they're not, but uh, that's a different issue, of course. Can I ask a question of Rebecca? Because uh, Rebecca, um, what would you like to uh, contribute to the conversation? Because I know that you have uh, been so important in uh, having uh, put the exhibitions together uh, that were significant um, uh, visual representations of Harold's work, as well as the uh, uh, celebrated e-contact uh, website that many scholars now are using uh, uh, in their research. And, and uh, in your background, interestingly, is in, in, uh, is in music. And I mean, maybe, maybe say s something a little bit about it, because well, I think your, your whole trajectory and then what you actually pushed forward uh, you know, is quite remarkable. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, but I want to, I will get to that. <laughs> in, in terms of Harold's business practices and his development, it seems like this is oscillation between like high innovation, maybe it's something that pe people don't really know how to perform yet, like the Warbo. And then I'm going to move to the Melodium, which may be more um, performance, uh, more acceptable. And then I'm going to go to the um, Melacord. And then I'm going to go to the SD organ, which is more popular organ. So it seems like he's always in this oscillating state between like innovation and then sort of trying to market it and back and forth and so on. I think there's cycles of that for Harold. Mm -hmm. And what else is there? Oh, and then in terms of putting it together, I, I have to mention Caspar Abokab. He was so significant in assembling the information uh, he came in, he, he read the, he knows how to read German, obviously he's German, who read the notebooks and gave us so much information. He would get me these instruments. I'm just like, nah, what? Instrument after instrument after instrument. I'm just like, no, 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 no. This is a one person, no way. And then I would discover them in the archive. So this sort of impossibility, I guess, of Harold Boda and his focus, and then sort of realizing it. And as well, I think it's easy to um, try and simplify his project. I think it's kind of easy to do that, but that's one thing that I was um, curious and intrigued and sort of like, startled by was the scope of it, the continuation of it. And I, the, the, I think there's a photo there of the SD Museum, like how do I get all of this in a sort of form that doesn't, that addresses all of them as they develop in the progression, like the network of thought that he was doing and be comprehensive, but I mean, also contained. Yeah which is really difficult to do. And I was talking to Pear the other day about this, like that I think in terms of Harold having these different lives, the life that he had in the thirties is this excuse, uh, struggling student, his, his life with the, uh, um, oh geez, entrepreneurs in the depression, right? His life, it, it's in, Southern Germany, post-war, developing the Melacord, his life coming to America with the SD Organ Museum. He had many, many lives, and they all present themselves through this work, this body of work. It's very interesting. Um, and there was something and, and, else. Oh, his creativity. I wanted to address his creativity and a, a thing that came up during the other conversations. Uh, he worked with a young engineer, Les Nichols in SD, who we, I was able to speak with directly with quite um, a bit. And he said, like, Harold would just change the names of the instruments they were working on. Like, he'd call the organ this thing one day and call it something that the other day. 
So he, he just could bounce around in a way. And it's his sort of creativity. It comes up in the uh, documentary too. It, so many forms that he was working in, not philosophy, writing, thus and such. It, he really could bounce around in a way. I think that's what's so amazing. I'll say one last thing that I was thinking as well. Uh, the computer, he ended his career with the computer. And it's, there's a quote in the book saying, it let me do everything I always wanted to do. Writing, music, design, mathematics. So, so in this way, he's um, a lesson for us, I guess. And also his ability to focus in, like how is he able to sustain for so long? I think it's because he knew he was part of a larger project, a larger project of like music in people's lives and that he could address or was interested in the popular forms and how that is um, meaningful. And also the innovation of sound. I think Pear said that too, that how, how it could bridge, not just bridge surf, art and technology in a way that was um, deliberate and extensive and focused. Talking about the legacy, um, somehow that like through the exhibitions, through those radio plays, also through the archive, um, the legacy of Harald Bode lives on, right? And there's a, a other project which is also part of um, Harald Bode's legacies, like the Carrier Band, which is done by, by you, Pierre, and also um, you, um, Rebecca, are part of this. Pauline Oliveros, I already mentioned her, and Andrew, Andrew Deutsch and Steffen with yellow are also part of that. And we want to um, close this conversation with a performance of them. Um, Can I say a thing about that? Before, yeah, please, yeah, before, please, of course. Yeah, which yeah. Uh, uh, this ties back into the archive in a very interesting way. Uh, around 1995, Andrew Deutsch, who was teaching at Alfred University, teaching sound, um, he began to transfer Harold Boda sound recordings uh, uh, to digital. And uh, in 1998, Pauline Oliveros, who Andrew had studied with at RPI, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, in Troy, uh, to find out that Pauline said that uh, Harold Boda was one of her inspirations. And he was quite surprised to hear that. Uh, we invited her to perform uh, at Alfred and we performed in 98. And that was the first performance of Carrier Band. Uh, the, car the piece was called Carrier. Uh, and subsequent to that, Pauline said to uh, Andrew, uh, uh, and she had just started her deep listening band just a few years before also, that's interesting. Um, she said, Carrier Band is something you all should continue because it's a great opportunity for you to explore the Harold Boda archive. Uh, and you will come to understand what it is in a much deeper, richer way by doing that. So Pauline in the, in the uh, carrier in, uh, uh, is not only helped us form the band, but really even understood before we did really what some of the value of that would be. Uh, and uh, one other thing I just want to say, which is not about Carrier Band, but is about the Institute for Electronic Arts, where I'm, I've been co-director, co-founder together with Joseph Shear. Uh, in the 2005, around that time, uh, we began to scan the Harold Boda notebooks. And Joseph Shear said, you have to scan them at a very high res, not just a utility scan, but a res where you can have a very large scale digital print of any of the pages of the notebook. Uh, and that scanning went on for three years. Uh, uh, and uh, Stephen Pedersen scanned and, and uh, uh, Devin Henry and uh, Chris uh, da McDaniels. Um, so that was, it, it took three years to scan those notebooks. Uh, uh, and Casper Abacob, when he came in 2009 to visit the archives here in Hornell, and he, sta he stayed at our place for a week and listened to recordings and uh, looked at uh, the notebooks. Um, uh, and a year later was when he did his first radio play mm -hmm. uh, uh, feature. Uh, and uh, that next year was also when Rebecca put the SD organ exhibition together. Uh, and then the following year, the e-contact uh, uh, project uh, happened and that website went up. Um, 
uh, the exhibition at the Birchfield Penny Art Center happened. Uh, 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 the second radio program that Casper did happened all within a relatively short amount of time. But part of the point in, in just laying that out is that um, I, uh, it, uh, and it's been part of my pleasure and interest also to um, uh, uh, like share the legacy or share the archive with many people or to put it another way, it was clear to me over and over again, there seemed to be some amazing excitement by many, many different people about what Harold had done. Uh, and that includes even, you know, we just had this uh, wonderful movie, uh, Sisters with Transistors um, uh, happened. And, um, uh, you know, Pauline, she was inspired by Harold Boda. Uh, Marianne Amaker called me on the phone I, out of the blue. I didn't know who she was. And she said, I just want to tell you how much your father meant to me in my work. Uh, uh, um, Wendy Carlos, wrote in the notes uh, uh, in some of the correspondence, Harold, uh, I did not um, give you credit on the albums because your frequency shifter was my secret weapon. Uh, that was part of her secret of her sound. Uh, uh, Susan Ciani, uh, uh, in fact, I, I just Andrew just told me that there's a, a new documentary, uh, what the heck was it called? It was called uh, tune, Auto Tune. Uh, and there's a whole section with Susan Gianni, and she's sitting right in, in front of the vocoder, prominent. Um, so, it, you know, this thing of how, how many people were influenced by his work and how it continues to live and people are, you know, Susan Gianni is still making music with that vocoder. Um, you know, I'm right behind me to the left is the vocoder that I have. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's, um, that's something that really, uh, you know, for, for me, last thing I'll say about this is, um, uh, for me, I was always a little early on, in a sense, almost embarrassed uh, to move forward the Harold Boda uh, legacy project because it was my father. And I felt, well, you know, everybody has a parent and a father and there's mother and love for the family, et cetera. Um, and it actually took me time uh, as a uh, uh, as an artist and as a media artist, uh, uh, and uh, having studied, unlike my brother, who really went in the direction of Hollywood filmmaking, in highly successful cinematographer, remarkable work that Ralph did, uh, I really uh, was uh, charged by and thought that the work was much more interesting and important. That was in what's called experimental cinema or independent cinema. But what I learned from that was this thing about personal media. And I suddenly actually was able to see my own father's project in a completely different light, like a person in a sense I almost didn't know, but I could really appreciate because he was about personal media. The, the vocoder, as Tom said, existed as an industrial tool. Poppy wanted to make it for musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Casper also pulls out this idea that he was really preparing the world uh, uh, for the idea of like the home studio or the complete studio, like a completely yeah. different paradigm for how music production is done, et cetera. And, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's just, um, so for me, this thing of uh, independent media, uh, he's suddenly my father could become for me a hero of independent media who I, and I have, there are many heroes I have that are, uh, are in that realm. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's um, I think it's, it's that thing of also where you have media histories and media histories in ZKM is so connected to all of that, which is why it's so splendid for his work to be there. Uh, because there's a way of actually seeing, not just seeing his legacy in a larger framework, but actually seeing that what he's doing is ac was actually a, it's an extremely contemporary idea now, 21st century. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you for the conversation. It was a pleasure. And now Thank enjoy you. the career band performance. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah.
We're on? Okay. So we start? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's performance of Slipstream by Carrier Band. Uh, we've had um, uh, an evening of gremlins going wild here. Uh, but we're, I think we're, I think we're back on track. So um, thank you for uh, uh, going online and uh, participating in our event. Uh, I'm going to read a few things here just so I remember and get all the pieces uh, together. So carrier band tonight is Andrew Deutsch, Rebecca Paloff, and myself, Per Boda. Uh, Andrew is in Amman, New York. Uh, Rebecca and I are in Hornell. Uh, New York. Uh, John Malinowski and the Birchfield team are in Buffalo, New York, uh, streaming our feed to the Birchfield Penny Facebook page. Um, our, for our first live screaming, uh, screening performance, uh, we'd like to thank the Birchfield Penny Art Center and the Cullen Foundation for their support and uh, their producing and hosting this event. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Institute for Electronic Arts, the IEA, at Alfred University for their support for this project. Uh, this event is the result of the Electronic Arts Alliance, which is a partnership between the Birchfield Penny Arts Center and the IEA. The good, this good thing is people working together to make new electronic art. Tonight, Carrier Band will perform Slipscreen. Uh, it is slipstream. It is interesting uh, in live electroacoustic music uh, that you have the name of the event before the event. For a slipstream, Andrew will perform, be performing with historical sound recordings of Pauline Oliveros. One is a 1996 recording Pauline made playing what she called her expanded instrument. She played it, electronics and all, in her backyard. Andrew has altered her recording to emulate her sound that he heard for the first time when he heard Pauline play. Uh, Rebecca will, uh, will live electronically process historical Harold Boda recordings as well as sounds of physical instruments from Harold Boda's workshop. Uh, I will be performing uh, voice text with the Boda vocoder instrument. I will also be playing the video Uber organ made in 2002, made with a digital frame buffer that I built together with David Jones at the Experimental Television Center in Owego, New York. The video is a traveling through some of Harold Boda's, who's a pioneer in electronic music instrument design, Harold Boda's 50 years of notebooks. And I, here's sort of the key. His notebooks were a place to inhabit and imagine new sound possibilities and new electronic futures, the notebooks. Lastly, let's remember why we are live streaming this performance. Yes, we are in a global pandemic, uh, the first uh, most of us have ever known. What can we say about this that has been so damaging to so, so many people's lives? I received this fragment of an email from a very good friend of mine this afternoon. I'll read it, just a, a small part of it. It goes as follows. Regretfully, my 73-year-old cousin was isolated for 55 days on a ventilator with a breathing tube and in a coma. She expired the other day. No visitors, no words, no holding, hand-holding, all alone. She caught the virus from her doorman who used to pet her dog every morning. He was 38 years old, and he died as well. The, the virus is very real. Wow. Uh, let us all hope that we are over this painful time soon. Thank you for going online and participating in this event. We hope the sounds and the images are spirited and magical. We are going to be going live. One last thought. We will perform for approximately 45 minutes. If for some reason we go away or glitch, don't go away, we will be back. As Peter Weibel said, there's something very special and even, uh, um, what's the word that he used, uh, sort of like moral or something, 
profound about uh, making art and experimenting in public. So here we go.
help of Pia Lodetta, who represent the Buddha archive from the Institute of Archives, Georg Anna Steinmeier, and Thomas Ray, and some others, and some scannings by Devin Henry of Alfred University, the digitization of some tapes by Andrew Deutsch, and the help of Wolfgang Dieckmann, who transcribed ancient German writing, and some visits to archives, both archives in hell, I was able to explore Harold Buddha's life and do a radio program on him, which was broadcast regionally, countrywide, in Germany, and all over the internet. I will do another one with this year. And with the help of internet technology, I could participate to a certain extent by the opening of this exhibition in the SD Museum, the place where Harold had worked from 1954 to 1959, heading for the ultimate electronic world. I was listening when Harold Wow. 
Thank <laughs> you. 